Hey everybody, I have a new episode here. It's recruiters talking about the hiring process, what goes on behind the scenes in the background, and uh, the state of the industry. I hope you find it useful. Oh, and don't forget to click subscribe and like. Hey Keith, how are you doing tonight? Doing well, JP, how are you? I'm doing good, good here in the Midwest. So what part of the world are you calling in from tonight? Also the Midwest, coming from Madison, Wisconsin, and not too far from you. That's a great town. I was full disclosure. We were up there what a couple months ago doing the M plus Dev panel, which was a lot of fun, and it was cool to hang out in Madison. Really impressed with the scene up there. Um, yeah, very good time. Yeah, it was a blast. So, what's your current role? Because I think people are going to find this interesting. I'm a senior recruiter with Craft and Americas. We centralized recently. I was specifically at Striking Distance Studios prior to this. Uh, I'm still supporting them, but I'm also mm -hmm. supporting a multitude of other studios and the corporate functions at Craft Done. Cool. Busy person, I'm sure. Um, so zooming back, like thinking back, like how did you get started recruiting in the game industry? Kind of curious about that story. Well, I, I think it's funny because EA Tiburon was the first mm. place I ever submitted a resume to okay. coming out of college. I was a, I was a Madden junkie in college and <laughs> it was a, it was an entry level marketing position. Mm -hmm. And I was like, ah, why, you know, might as well. And, right. uh, I, I never heard back. <laughs> so <laughs> fast forward. Not even a form email, not even a no, thanks, but no, no thanks. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. No, nothing. Crickets. I think they, you know, they probably looked at Wisconsin and were like, you know, this is a job in Florida. Well, you know, right. Next. Yes. So, right. <laughs> Right. It was unfortunate, but uh, fast forward uh, 10 years later, I was I already had 10 years of experience within recruiting mm -hmm. and I right. got cold called by a recruiter at Activision and and that was in 2013 and he started talking about Raven software and I knew okay. about Raven. I had played their games and you know when it's one of the only studios in the state that you live in and you're <laughs> a video game junkie like you know who they are right. and i think i caught i think i caught him off guard and i said yeah i'm actually looking at the studio right now it was hmm. literally i was in the adjacent building to raven <laughs> That's so awesome. he had you know he had no idea at that time <sighs> um so then i i went and interviewed and i remember it was kind of awkward because I threw on a tie to go in and <laughs> interview at a video game studio. And right. I remember going to a different floor in my building to put my tie on to walk over. And oh. um, it was like the beginning of January. So I was just like went over no coat and right. and um, they had secure they had a secure building. So I'm like outside and <laughs> and the admin wasn't at her desk up front. So I'm like just like freezing and hypothermia before the interview. <laughs> so that was how I got into the games industry. So came in on a contract and okay. it was essentially an 18 month stint that I was on contract. Then I was brought on full time by Raven and then mm -hmm. eventually converted over to full time with Activision. So they had a centralized recruiting team and HR team, and then they placed you at a specific studio. So okay. I got to represent mainly raven but then a bunch of other studios like high moon and vicarious visions toys for bob and mm. uh, sledgehammer no that's very cool so thinking back like what do you wish you had known about the game industry when you got started just really how small it is and the longer you're in it the smaller it gets <laughs> um you know, and I mentioned this before, like, you know, I was lit literally referred to you in 2016 by someone that we mutually knew. And, you know, fast right. forward eight years later, we're on a, pa a hiring panel in at a conference, um, yeah. you know, talking again. And it wasn't until, you know, we started talking about this podcast that I realized like, oh, yeah, we talked like eight years ago. Uh, right, about, about right you know position so yeah you know as a production and, and going up to madison and everything and yeah exactly so yeah. you know really it's it's the kind of theme of that is network early network often um mm -hmm. 
you know, if you're a pro, don't burn bridges. Definitely yeah. don't burn bridges. <laughs> I don't feel I don't feel like I have, but I've I've had yeah. I've had quite a few people burn bridges with me, or burn mm-hmm. bridges with other people. That when I send that hiring manager that particular resume, they're like, nope. <laughs> so yeah, that's just, you, you don't do yeah. it, but you know, I do say like, Hey, if somebody approaches you for a conversation, like you never know mm-hmm. what the situation is going to be yeah. down the road. And, you know, it's always good to build those, those relationships and connections over time. Cause mm-hmm. again, eight years later, we're, we're doing this, we're talking about, right. you know, doing the same role in, in the same industry. Yeah. So it's, it, right. you know, you never know what situations you're going to run into and always, you know, always be open to having those conversations and networking. Yeah. And I went back and I looked at, you know, that, that's the beauty of LinkedIn. You can see the, that history. And I was like, God, that was our conversation. And, you know, you were cool. I was cool. And it was all good, you know, and that's, that's the way you do it, you know? And yeah, that was, uh, it was cool to see that. And yeah, you're right. You know, the longer you're in this industry, the smaller it gets, especially not just in the game industry, but especially in the Midwest. Right. So yeah, it's, it's a wild, <laughs> you know, well, even, to, even MDev, you know, that conference totally felt like it was a Raven reunion when you start right. looking at, when you start mm-hmm. looking at the other studios here, you know, ZeniMax, Bethesda, right. um, PUBG, Madison and mm-hmm. Respawn, like they're all, people I used to work with, you know, right. most of the, right. most of their leadership teams are, are, are people that I've worked with. So, you mm-hmm. know, when you start looking at Madison of becoming this, you know, gaming hub, you know, it's cool to look at these other studios and be like, you are my art director. You are my executive <laughs> producer. Um, yeah. You know, I, I hired 14 of you <laughs> and, <laughs> and now you're in like upper level roles. Like that's, that's really cool to me. And, you know, it's, it's fun to have those relationships and, you know, that specific event, it was just, you know, cool to see people and mm-hmm. reminisce. Yeah. And, and for me to be, to be up in Madison, just to see uh, how, how big the industry is up there and, and all those studios. Like, um, I mean, yeah. Three of these studios, like, it's crazy when you think about it of like, you know, three of the top battle royale games in the industry <laughs> are made here in Madison, Wisconsin. And yeah, that's, that's most, wild. Most, pe- right. most people don't even know that. I mean, right. Or even walking around here with, you know, your swag on and people are like, oh, Call of Duty. Cool. Did you work there? And I'm like, yeah, it's made here. Right. Yes, California. millions, <laughs> millions of dollars of, of video game money is is flowing through here. <laughs> Credit to Raven and what it built and all that kind of stuff. And it is exciting to see those growths in these different areas outside of the traditional LA's, San Diego's, New York, San Francisco's, Seattle's, you know, um, to have representation in those other areas. So if the listeners out there are looking to get their first job, I'll just list off the titles and just kind of throw me some thoughts, you know, what about the first job as an artist, designer, programmer, producer, like, um, any kind of thoughts jump to mind for those different types of disciplines? The current climate right now is just absolutely brutal. And, you know, it's harder than ever to get a job in this industry, which it's already been a hard industry to get into for a lot of people, you know, with so many veterans that are open to work or available right now, it's like a lot of studios that are hiring are are trying to jump on that. But really kind of generally speaking, you really have to understand, you know, what you're looking for, like what role Mm -hmm. each department has a whole bunch of niches within them. So wanting to make sure you understand what it is you want to do and where you're applying, you know, is this a smaller studio where you can be a generalist in your, Mm -hmm. in your field, or is this a larger AAA studio where you are, your vertical is very small, (laughs) right? You Um, do hair on characters. That is your role. Alpha, lots of hair. Yeah. And that, and that's a, you know, that's a big difference, but, you know, understanding, you know, the track of, of how to get there, and, you know, I look at most hiring managers having really defined responsibilities uh, for their levels of role. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you're first trying to get in, it's like, well, what are the expectations of, of somebody trying to get in, you know, in a junior artist position in AAA? And, you know, one of the areas that I always talk about is... Number one, you're only as good as your worst piece in your portfolio. Um, specifically, mm-hmm. 
And, and this can go across outside of just art too. Yeah. Um, but I always tell people that where it's just like, don't put a bunch of work in progress in there, you know, have finished pieces, but make sure that every piece in there is meaningful and, and helps define who you are as an artist. Um, mm -hmm. Another area that I look at specifically with artists is, you know, where are you applying? Like, what is their style? Do you have something that showcases or mimics that style because mm, we ran into yeah. that a lot with with call of duty is that we would we would see a lot of people applying that would have absolutely no photo real experience within their right. portfolio so it's hard to gauge of like you know can they do this and at what level how long is this going to take them and mm. everybody loves art tests so it's like <laughs> <laughs> if you're not going to do art tests, you know, like, how do you understand that that person can do that? So, you know, having pieces in your portfolio that are, that can be kind of tied specifically to the art style of, of the studio or the game, because mm -hmm. a lot of studios work on a bunch of different games and they might not all have the same style, um, right. but kind of being able to show that range design it, it tends to be a little bit harder, but if you've worked on game projects within school or if you've done game projects on your own, kind of showcasing your understanding of the engine, or if you've done, I tell a lot of people, like if they can't get their experience in games, like mm -hmm. find your experience, yeah. join, join different groups that are modding a game right. and do it that way. Kind of take the reins and, and run with it. Go on Discord. Hired, yeah. Find people to connect with. Yeah. Yeah. There's no lack of ability to do that or opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. And I've hired a number of designers because they worked on a particular mode or mod for, for a game. So, you know, unsanctioned, you know, Steam workshop type of thing yep. where it showcased their ability to to run with this. Like one one person in particular just created brand new game modes from scratch. So it was like, cool. okay, this showcases their ability to go into the engine, change things, understand what these what these calls are doing. And that can be across both engineering, programming, and design. So mm -hmm. um, you know, those are really good areas that you can kind of focus on and, you know, cut your teeth before you're even in the industry. Cause that's going to set you apart from a lot of people that only right. have kind of theor theoretical experience or other experiences from curriculum versus actually mm -hmm. doing it. Yeah. You know, production, I hired very few producers at Raven mm -hmm. that didn't come up through the ranks. So yeah, the vast majority, or, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. vast majority of, me, of people yeah. that now are senior producers or executive producers, lead producers, yeah, they mm -hmm. started in QA and they went that track. Right. So, you know, I would say like, don't shy away from experiences. Don't look at something as a time sink or like this was a complete waste of time. Cause if you right. can take something out of that and be able to showcase it within a portfolio, or at least be able to talk about it in an interview, like mm -hmm. that's just light years ahead of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And right now it's all about differentiating yourself from that next person because right. each role, especially junior roles, like you're talking at AAA studios, minimum 500 applicants, minimum. For right. every junior role. That's the same for QA too, because a lot of people know and understand this, that, you know, mm -hmm. QA can be your foot in the door. And a lot of studios like Raven had mentorship programs already set up. It's like, oh, you want to be a designer? Well, we have a mentorship program for QA to move you into design, or we have a mentorship yeah. for art to move you or production. Mm -hmm. So you can get that experience early when you're still in QA, and then you're, you're working on that trajectory. Right. Yeah. I, I think QA is Cool from a couple perspectives because like you get to see how the sausage is made right like you're behind mm -hmm. the scenes right like you're like oh this is how you do stuff and oh i gotta you know back in the day sit at the engineer's office on the dev kit and repro the bug right there so they can capture it and like you really get a first-hand view of how stuff works and then from there you can kind of go oh i want to you know pivot this way or, or down the road i want to get out of qa and go to this and you know, there are people I hired when I was managing QA in the 90s at Viacom New Media who then went on to get out of QA and do art, to do engineering, and then they went on to start game studios, you know, and they've 
kind of grown there. So there's there's a lot of you know value through QA. Now it's you know it's getting trickier now too with more outsourcing and stuff like that. But you know if you're local and there's places where you can be in person at QA here in 2024, I, I think there's a lot of value to to being in QA when you haven't figured out exactly where you want to go or you're having a hard time getting that first job you know in the industry because um yeah it's it's a great learning experience even though it's not Absolutely. easy it's a good way to be seen you know because a lot of these promotions are going to happen internally and if somebody you're working with is you know senior a lead or manager department right. head then they're like wow this guy's sharp yeah like that can lead you to so many you know, so many different aspects within the organization. So it's not right. like you just have to get your experience there and go elsewhere. Like mm -hmm. the best opportunities are going to be within the studio that you're currently in. Right. Yeah. Like that person is punctual. They, they do great work. They're technical. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's see if, you know, they want that entry level tech designer role to, you know, build levels out and stuff. Um, what about advice for people looking to advance their career right now? They're in the industry. They're an artist. They're a designer. They're a producer, programmer. What do you want to do to stay sharp, stay current, kind of go to that next stage? Yeah, I think the biggest thing there is to make sure that you're keeping up with, you know, kind of what the hot trends are. You, what are people using in terms of techniques tools. and tools? Mm -hmm. Um I think, t you know, having an understanding and, and an expertise in tools, I think will take you places. I start looking, you know, when I, when I was looking at people making that transition to substance and yeah. all of a sudden Photoshop just became obsolete. Like it right. wasn't, it wasn't even needed or accepted anymore um, right. after yeah. a certain period of time, because it was just like, everybody's using substance designer, substance painter. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can, if you can understand what the trends are, where the industry's going or, you know, who's looking for what and mm -hmm. honing in on that. Cause I would start looking, you know, you can even look at job descriptions out there of like, what tools are they asking for right. a senior environment artist or a senior designer? Like what is their right. expectation? And kind yeah. of what going back to what I said before of like hiring managers have a very defined set of responsibilities per level. So like if you're a mm -hmm. mid-level and you're trying to figure out how to go to a, a senior level, like mm -hmm. that manager is going to have a really good understanding of, you know, what accomplishments or what specific experience that you need in your current role to be able to level up. And right. I think that's important from the standpoint of like asking questions and, and making sure you understand what it takes, but also showcasing like, hey, I want this. I want to level up. Like, I'm not just going to sit here and expect somebody to promote me because I've seen a lot of people who are very passive yeah. sit right. in their same role for five, six, seven years. Mm -hmm. And then I've seen others who are in their role for two or three years and they're like, I should be a senior. Right. Um, so, you know, I think one of the biggest things is like, don't be passive, you yeah. know, make sure you make sure you understand what it's going to take to get to that next level, that next rung. And, mm -hmm. you know, just what those experiences or details are to, to get you there. And mm -hmm. most hiring managers, leads, department managers, they're going to be more than willing to have those conversations with you because they want you to level up too, but mm -hmm. they want you to level up for the right reasons as opposed to like, sure, you can go the one route and say things like, well, if I don't get this, I'm going to leave. And then you get this right. kind of fictitious promotion because they don't want you to leave. Um, right. You know, I look at that as like, it's way better to to do that the the right way, if you will. Yeah, and right you know, understand what those needs are of that next position and go that route. The other big thing I would say is uh, mentoring and training, like being an active mm -hmm. member within, within your group, within your, your, your society, if you will. Yeah. Um, and, and that could be outside Tribe. of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause that could be outside of, out of, you know, outside of your company. Cause if you're, you know, a senior and there's only seniors there, it's kind of hard to mentor people that are at the same level as you right. or to get yeah. the same, to get the same measurement out of it, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so many options like uh, Amir Satvat 
is one of those yeah. where he's just got right, this yeah. huge, huge list of people that are are willing to mentor, um, mm-hmm. you know, donate their time and, and mentor others within the industry. So it's very easy to just throw yourself on a list and, you know, mentor others. And then it's, it all, it's all about having things to talk about. It's very similar to an interview where mm-hmm. it's just like, if you have these experiences that you can talk about eloquently or articulate well, like that's going to go so far for, right you know, for advancement, because, you yeah. know, you want to be seen as a driven person, because, you know, nobody's going to sit there and promote the person that they're just like, oh, they have a just sour attitude, and they don't right, seem like right. they care. <laughs> right, right. This isn't the DMV, right? Like, oh, well, you've been here 10 years, I guess we need to give you a promotion, right? Like, yeah, you, you want to be hungry, you want to be ambitious, you want to be learning tools, so that you can take those steps. And, and the people that just... I'll call it coasting, right? Like they're not yeah. pushing themselves. They're just sitting back, being passive. They're not learning the new tools. You, you know, they're they're going to get passed over in promotions, and then you know, down the road, if there's layoffs or trims that need to happen, they could be on the block, right? So it's like, yeah, you can't be passive. You can't be complacent. You have to be learning tools. You have to be upping your game all the time because it should be your passion. It should be what you love, and it should feel tedious and painful and i just want to watch netflix instead right like you know that, that's part of what drives the best people in the industry is they're just driven by what we're doing and how to push the boundaries and do cool shit um, yeah that's my soapbox <laughs> it's a good one <laughs> <laughs> um what's an important general quality or skill just universally to have in the game industry like anything to speak that broadly that you're comfortable or you think of? yeah i i think of i think of four things and i think of flexibility openness mm-hmm. collaborativeness and yeah. just having a positive attitude mm-hmm. um and it's like it's easier said than done in a lot of these things <laughs> but um you know if you go in and you're just super rigid about you know what you want to do like it, it's the yeah. that you know that's not my job mentality right yeah yeah that's not going to get you get you anywhere but the openness no. to take on new challenges get yourself out of your comfort zone maybe work mm-hmm. on something that is brand new or you know if if you're looking at you know, I can think of ZBrush, for instance, like mm-hmm. our studio just didn't really, that wasn't, that wasn't part of the art pipeline at all. And yeah. somebody came in and they were really skilled at ZBrush and said, well, I think we should be doing this. Like this should absolutely be part of our art right. pipeline. So look at what we can and, do, right? ABC. Yeah. And yeah, he yeah. showcased his work and that was why he was hired. Cause he was like, Holy crap, look at this, look at this dude's per- portfolio. And he came in and showcased that and started doing Friday night ZBrush like oh, classes right, with, yeah, yeah. with artists at the studio. And that cool. time we're, you know, we're talking like, yeah, when was this? I think it was like 40 or 50. So this was, this was like 2015, mm. 2016. Mm-hmm. And and it was just kind of amazing. You're talking about 40 to 50 artists that right. are part of the art team. And you had a lot of people that had a lot of interest in doing this. And, you know, they they did it very casually. And it was, you yeah. know, at the studio and there were beers involved. And <laughs> yeah, right. It's like <laughs> it a lunch like and that, learn, so. but a beer and learn, you know, after hours. And no, that's that's great. Like uh, right. that's fantastic. Yeah. So it's like I feel like that is you know, that meets like, you know, three of those. And then you get the positive side because now you're mentoring and teaching somebody um, mm-hmm. or it could, I mean, at that, I think at the peak, there were like 15, 20 people, 20 artists that were like regularly going to these Friday nights. Cool. And, you know, that showcases the flexibility that that person's donating their time to make their team better. So right. that also goes into the collaboration bucket as well. And, right. yeah, yeah. you know, I feel like this is like a lot of those aspects are, you know, those interpersonal skills and Mm -hmm. that's, what's going to separate you from the multitude of other candidates that are vying for the same jobs or the same promotions, same titles, Mm -hmm. you know, things like that, especially if you're looking at it from having, you know, basically the same hard skills. Yeah. Right. The core skills, as they call it, versus the hard skills, and right, people could have the same core skill, or excuse me, hard skills, but then the core skills um, can raise them up. And you know, I get it too, right? Like it doesn't come naturally to people, right? Like 
I'm an introvert. This takes a lot of energy for me. I'm usually exhausted after talking to people and doing things, but you know, you just have to find a way to do it because it, that's just the world we live in. And you know, if you can do it, even if you need time to recharge and stuff, it, it'll help your career. And, um, it, it helps you as a person and it helps other people. I, you know, I think that's, that's awesome that, that people are doing that. And, you know, it rises all boats when you can bring everybody up on these tools and just makes the games that much better. Right. Instead of like, well, we always do it the same way, you know, rinse and repeat, you know, that, that just doesn't fly. Right. Like this industry is too dynamic for that kind of. Well, and I think that that is mindset. a good point too, just in terms of like extrovert versus introvert, because this, this would probably sound horrifying to somebody who's like super introverted, but there's other ways. Like you don't have to be one-on-one -on -one mentorship would be, you know, an easier way to do that as opposed totally, to right. teaching a class of 15 to 20 people right. or getting yeah, yeah. in front of a bunch of people to do a presentation of why this should be, you know, part of our art pipeline. Yeah. Um, Doing it other ways that are less uh, intimidating, right? You, you know, so find ways to do it and not just be like, well, no, that's not my thing. I, I just sit here and write code and do art. Like, I, I don't want to talk to anybody. Like, you have to find avenues to to do that kind of stuff, I think. Yeah, and that's getting you out of your comfort zone in a lot of cases. Yeah. But, you know, I think right. that can showcase a lot to other people and, you know, cause them to open up to you, Um and it's just a you know very positive thing overall that you can get out of that. Um, but yeah, it is it's a little different, a little more difficult if you're if you're an introvert versus an extrovert because that stuff's going to come right. a little bit more natural. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it just you know it takes practice, and it's one of those things. The more you do it, the more you get comfortable with it. Yep. You know, and um, and then also learning your you know the skills you got to keep learning those skills like I, I see candidates sometimes and you look at the resumes and it's just like you can just look like they peaked at 2011 they haven't done anything since then right like you just see it on the resume it's like they just stopped and they kind of checked out and it's just like and then they've never moved on well from there and bounce to bounce and bounce for jobs so like you know again it's about building skills learning new software growth mindset and figuring out how to keep evolving as an artist, designer, programmer, producer, whatever it is. Yeah, um, and, I've, I've, and I've seen that of like roles having to change because the person's skill set is the same, you mm -hmm. know, where it's like for that same level of role, it has to completely change because they don't have the skill set. It's like, oh, well, mm -hmm. they don't they don't actually do any implementation in the engine. They don't they don't touch the engine at all. It's like, but you're right. asking that of a new hire. I think, you know, a good example of that is UI, like back in the day, like artists would build the UI and have these giant Photoshop files with all these layers and just like throw it over the fence. And then some engineer would sit there and have to plug it in and use the arrow keys to move buttons around. And it was tedious and the screens weren't interesting or dynamic or juicy as they say, right? But now when you empower the artists and they can build the assets and put them in engine and make them dynamic with sparkles and animations and stuff, you get a better product. We kind of touched on this earlier, but like, you know, what's your advice about developing those interpersonal skills, the EQ, the core skills, you know, get out of your comfort zone, figure out small ways to do one-on-one -on -one versus in front of a crowd, like any ideas? Yeah. On top of, on top of those aspects, I think, a lot of it is just being open to feedback and asking for specific feedback from multiple sources, like not just mm -hmm. your lead who you're comfortable with or the person that sits next to you that interfaces with you, but get it from all of them, like yeah. get it from your manager, get it from someone in another department, like mm -hmm. get that honest feedback from a variety of people, because that's going to be the biggest thing that's going to showcase how you are outside of, you know, what you think you are or how you think you're perceived. Like right. these are people telling you what you could do better, what you could work on. Yeah. Um, and, and not just from like the, I'm going to wait till the end of the year to hear my manager's feedback right. about me yeah, yeah, yeah. during my review. Right. So this is, you know, kind of the theme of constantly growing, constantly changing, making sure that you're constantly building who you are yeah. and understanding how to do that. And 
people will tell you how to do that or what you could do be be doing better. And I think, you know, asking for feedback and even finding a mentor either within your organization or outside of your organization um, mm-hmm. that can work with you on certain things, especially if you know, like, I'm really bad at getting in front of people. Like, yeah. I'm really bad at showcasing, like, my feedback on a playthrough or, you know, something like that where it's just, yeah. you don't, you you know what the problem is, but you don't know how to get to the solution, how you make yourself better. So, you know, openly talking about these things with, you know, people in your organization or if you don't feel comfortable with that, like, there's a ton of people, there's a giant list, like 700 people that are willing to mentor and like, at, you know, at least hear your feedback and give feedback based on um, Mm -hmm. interactions and and things like that. So I think that's really important is to understand and then try to hone as best that you can to just continue to be better. And and I think too, like it's human nature. Like we all have blinders on, right? There's stuff that we just don't know that we don't know. And and if you're open to it and people are willing to give it, you're like, Oh yeah, I never thought about that. Right. Like I, I literally wrote like, that. You you don't know what you don't know. No, <laughs> like, <it's- laughs> that, that, like that frame, like that, that mindset comes to mind where it's, you know, it's true. You only know mm-hmm. what you know. And, and, a lot of times, you know, it's the same thing with like writing a paper, like when you're in high school or college where it was like, yeah. you know, you're reviewing it, but, that's not the best thing to do. Like you go through it, but you've got those blinders on. You wrote this thing. So yeah, yeah. send it, send it to somebody else, have them review it, get their mm-hmm. perspective on it because it can really help to enlighten you. Um, mm-hmm. I, I feel like part of this comes from marriage as well, or relationships <laughs> where it's just like, you yeah. know, you have that, you have that other person that cares about you and everybody has their flaws. Everybody has their right. great aspects. And, you know, right. the person that, that loves you is probably more willing to give you that hard conversation. Now they think about it also like do that with your resume people, right? Like have mm-hmm. other people look at your resume and get critical feedback from other people who are trustworthy, right? Not TikTokers who tell you what to do and don't know what they're doing, Um, you know, but like actual people that will give you feedback on your resume because they'll find typos. They'll be like, this is really long, right? Or, you know, other things like that. So like get other perspectives on your resume, running even through chat GPT, just looking for, you know, like don't just live in your own head and send your resume out and then 400 resumes submissions later i don't know is getting back to me like well there's something wrong with your resume right like you know any things you want to share about that i mean we see these resumes every day you know it's like it it goes for your portfolio for your linkedin like everything and and you know that it that's a good point too where it's just like hey don't just go to where you think your peers are because Mm -hmm we're probably not there. If you're an artist and you're just going, you just have all your stuff on art station period. And you don't go anywhere else. Like, Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I'm on art station when I need to be, but where am I most of the time I'm on LinkedIn. Oh, I don't Mm -hmm. need to be on LinkedIn. If I'm an artist, that's BS. No, you do. (laughs) You do. It's part of the package, right? It's LinkedIn. It's art station. It's your resume, right? Like got to have those three. So, so yeah, you definitely want to be where your peers are, where you're being, where you're able to see who's doing what with what tools. But the other side Mm -hmm. of that is like, where, where are the recruiters? Where are the hiring managers? Right. And yeah, they're probably on on LinkedIn. It's yeah. just, but it's a different, you know. But it's a different format too. It's just like yeah. I could be on Art Station all day and not interact with anybody. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, if I'm on LinkedIn, I'm constantly interacting with people. So yeah, you know, there's differences. The platform provides a lot of differences. Um, mm. I'm not much of a Twitter. I'm an Xer. I don't even know what they're what what yeah. they're referring to anymore. But yeah, you know, know, if you know that people are there, like, go there. Be a part right. of that. Yeah. I had a conversation with an old colleague recently about LinkedIn. He's like, you know, Keith, I, I don't do, I don't do social media. I don't, I don't like social media. I, I actually absolutely hate it. And I'm like, but it doesn't matter what you like or not. Right. It's like, <laughs> right. If, if you're, it's if you're your talking job. about wanting, if you're talking about wanting to be seen and specifically wanting to be approached by recruiters, and this is yeah. totally outside of games, but yeah. I think the values are the same where it's like, you got to put in the effort. 
because mm-hmm. it's only you're you're going to get as much out of it as you put into it. Totally. And it sounds cliche, but it's like it's the reality of it. If you're right. just sitting there on LinkedIn hoping something's going to happen and you're not engaging with hiring managers, you're not engaging with recruiters, you're not engaging with companies that you're interested in, right. nobody's going to talk to you. Right. You're not going to get right. those messages. Yeah, you can't just be like, well, I just don't do social media. It's like, you know, maybe some jobs can get away with that, but anyone probably listening to this podcast can't do that. And, you know, to your point about ArtStation, I'm usually a bit surprised when I don't see artists who are on ArtStation, right? Just knowing that, like, that's Mm -hmm. the place to be. And it just, I had someone ask me when I was at the Paul last week, like, well, why are people on ArtStation? Like, it just is. That's just where it is. You, you know, Epic's got money behind it. And the best and the brightest people in art uh, and for the game industry are on our station. So you have to be there. So when people are like, oh, I, I don't want to go to art station. I put all this work into my personal website. I'm like, well, you can still have that, but you need to be there, right? Like, I mean, that, am I off base or, or do you? No, are no, you a little surprised when you don't see art station for, you know, no, an artist? Spot, no, specifically with artists, if I. Hmm. If I put their name into Art Station and nothing comes up, I'm just like, okay. <laughs> and right. and you know, you know, I think that's you need to have that, you know, especially now, like you need to have that stuff updated. You you need to be able to yeah. be found. Right. You know, I think I think Not previously student projects just like I'm happy at my job. Like I work at Naughty Dog. I don't want anybody like, people ping me all the time. Recruiters hit me yeah. up all the time, and I don't want that bother. It's like, well. You need to have a backup plan. You need to have that set up to where people are going to be able to engage with you and they're going to be able to, you know, see your work. You yeah. know, there's there's a lot of people that I've come across just because I've been strolling through ArtStation and I was like, mm-hmm. oh, look at this. And then you start diving into their work a little bit more. Yep. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, this person would be a really good fit for, you know, X role. Yep. And all of a sudden you're trying to make contact with that individual because you're like, hmm. This is perfect. This is exactly what I've been looking for. Yeah. And, totally. and that's why I say like you want to you want to use these platforms in different ways, but use a multitude of them because it's not going to hurt you. Right. Like there's right. very few instances where that's actually going to hurt you. But that also goes back to like you're only as good as your best piece in your portfolio. Like don't just spam right. all your work up there and things right, like right, that. Right. But that right. could make it worse. <laughs> yeah, that, that happened the other day. I, I, you know, I was thinking about tech artists, and I was up there looking, and you type in tech artists, and you see people, and I'm like scrolling, and I was like, oh, wow, this person's in Chicago. I'm like, they're open to cool, right? Like, I literally reached out to them, you know, because I was just – I happened to be in an art station. I was looking at tech artists. And, you know, that's, again, where people are. And when people have a resume and they're like, go to my Wix site or or click on my random Google Drive link. I'm like, what the hell? Like, don't don't send me a started on the, fucking on the Google, Google Drive, Drive link. link. <laughs> I'm like, that's ridiculous. Like, th- this site is free for the basic thing. This is where the talent is. This is where people are. Don't send me a damn Google link. If you have, like, certain portfolio pieces and want to protect them behind yeah, the password right, wall, right. like, that's right. one thing, but like, I don't watermark don't, don't them just, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Don't just use a, a random selection of images on Google Drive and call it your portfolio. <laughs> Please don't. It's 2024. The industry is too competitive to half ass it. Like, you know, I think it's one of the takeaways. It is so competitive. You can't half ass it. I, I don't know how else to say it. You got to have the right mindset. You got to do the right stuff because just checking the box doesn't cut it. And um, yeah. Yeah. Especially now. I mean, now. No, exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> we're recording this on the 28th and, you know, yesterday was Sony, today was EA, right? Like the industry is just going through a massive contraction, you know, and I, I did a whole talk at DePaul and part of the last week, part of it was talking about what's going on with the industry. We're just, you know, we're just, you know, and that means for every job, you know, it's, two or three X, the number of applicants that you used to get. And the number of jobs I used to see on Grackle HQ. You ever been on that site? It's a great aggregator. No. It's G with a Grackle. I interviewed a game designer a couple of years ago. And she told me about it. And I was like, whoa. Um, number of jobs up there are like shrunk in half, right? Like um, from when I used to look at it a year or two ago. So and it, it's a great site where you can just go on there and then just search by type of role or location or whatever. But it just scrapes all these websites for all the game companies and just centralizes it right there. It's super competitive. It's not saying you can't get jobs. It's not saying, you know, the sky's falling, but it's just the bar is higher and there's so many more 
people competing for a small amount of jobs, you've got to raise your game if if you want to be in it, no pun intended. But um yeah. 100%. What's been a favorite project of yours to work on? So there's there's a few, but they're, you know, kind of for different reasons. So okay. Number one for me would be Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. That was the first game that I was credited on. Um, and Raven specifically was in charge of the third pillar. So the third pillar was the zombies mode. So you had single hmm. player, multiplayer, and then the third pillar, zombies. zombies. So they were in charge of it. And it was just a really fun experience to see something that was really popular that existed and then just completely reimagined and the process that went into that. Mm -hmm. And it was like a two to three month, just hardcore heads down, crank it out. Mm -hmm. And because it wasn't originally going to be part of the game. So that would be one. Um, Warzone would be another one. Just <laughs> seeing something, a brand new mode come from, you know, nothing. Right. So that was the first time because Raven would come in and be like usually the third year of the three year dev cycle. So, so much was already done by the time it hit Raven, but this was something brand new. This was something that they got to develop on their own and it was just fun as hell to test it um, mm. and to give feedback. Cause it was like, it wasn't just like, Oh, we're, we're trying to something a little new or different with the zombies mode or with co-op. And like, yeah. this was like its own thing. And mm -hmm. everybody was excited about it because, you know, Battle Royale in general was exciting and, yeah. you know, newer. You know, there were a couple right. companies that were doing it, one of which I work for now. Um, but, <laughs> you know, it was exciting to, to be a part of that. And then the third one is the Callisto Protocol, uh, which Striking Distance did. Mm. And that was purely from the standpoint of being at a brand new studio so new triple a studio brand new right. ip um mm -hmm. having built up that studio from you know i was employee 56 you know we hired 130 people in 18 months and it was really wow it was really fun and exciting to see you know not only do you have this brand new studio you have this brand new ip and mm -hmm. you get to see it you know shape and form as you go so right um yeah that was that was really exciting and you know that was a new experience for me of like coming from you know call of duty that was you know obviously there were some you know large changes year to year but it's you know right. kind of like mad established like, ip right yeah you know right. it it's kind of the same <laughs> so yeah, yeah. this was yeah. something that was very very different and being a part of that from the beginning was was really exciting and just seeing all the you know things going from pre-production concept phase to putting it in game, working on the vertical slice. And, you know, I'd yeah. never been a part of a vertical slice <laughs> of that magnitude prior to that. And then, you know, obviously I'm, I'm excited about other things that we're doing right now that I can't, can't talk, talk about. about. <laughs> yeah. Totally fair. Um, totally fair. Yeah. But one of them that I'm really looking forward to is that is part of my company is Subnautica 2. And I'm excited about that particular game because um, Subnautica and Subnautica Sub Zero were two pretty big hits by Unknown Worlds, which are which is owned by Krafton. Subnautica 2 is, I think it's gonna be a banger. So you hired 180 people, you said, in, in what, year and a half? Something like that? 100, 130 30. in, yeah, 18 months. So wow. that's, that's I got in impressive. at 50, I got in at 56 and then mm -hmm. about, we were just shy of 200. So, I mean, it's over 130. It was probably closer to 150. I left, I went to Meta for a year. Um, mm -hmm. But when I left, we were just shy of 200 people. Yeah. And that was all from... <laughs> from february 2020 yeah oh to right 18 right. months yeah. <laughs> so you know very much yeah. still trying to figure out um because our you know our studio leadership was just like oh this will you know pandemic will be over in two to three yeah. months like we're still gonna right. have people relocate here and because it was be old, back to normal know, it, was, yeah. it was the old school time where you're building a studio people had to come to you if you wanted to go to a different studio you had to move your family you know right. stuff like that so right. it was yeah. a different time and, and we didn't know how we were going to react to it how long it was going to go. Mm -hmm. So 
really like probably that first six months, we were still holding strong to the, hey, we're going to relocate people. We are sheltered in place in California. So we're, we'll kind of defer that relocation. Yeah. But a lot of people were getting job offers that were contingent on relocating in the future. Hmm. So you know, as time went on, we're like, you know, we got to change this up. Like we're remote right. for right. however long now. And mm -hmm. if we're going to get the top talent, the best talent, well, everybody else is hiring remote. So we got to continue gotta doing compete. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so did that kind of open the floodgates when, when you went like remote first and for hiring, like, did that really help yeah. spur that, that hiring? Cause it did for us. Yeah, I, I know that. Yeah, for sure. And, and we had a couple things in place too, where, we decided we're looking at, okay, where the majority of devs going to come from, you know, what states, because right. we needed to have an entity in that state, you oh. know, basically a, a tax ID so that right. we could have people work there and we could payroll them and all that. So originally yeah. it was like, okay, we're already in California. So that's covered. So what's next? And then it was Texas and Washington. Texas, exactly. Right. And then we just started going, you know, beyond that and, and kind of picking states right. that made the most sense. And then we were adding states and it was just a very interesting experience coming from the six years prior, trying to right. relocate people from these places to, you know, Madison, Wisconsin versus yeah. now, now I'm working at studios in, in California that people have interest in relocating to, but now they can't, can't physically right. do it for a lot of reasons. <laughs> yeah. What's the point of having you relocate here if you're if we're all working from home. Yeah. So right. it, it brought a different, a very different mindset. Um, but it was like, you know, it's still mm -hmm. going on today and it's, you know, you're yeah. still having that debate of the return right. to office and versus fully remote. And there's a number of studios out there that are really pushing the, we are a remote first, right. um, uh, just a brand new one that I saw today was pushing that specifically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I know they're going to garner a ton of interest because there's a lot of big, you know, big studios, big publishers that are RTO, RTO. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm sure you talk to people that I talk with that get hired during the, the peak of the pandemic. And then now they're being told they have to move to Irvine or wherever it is. And they're like, I'm not doing that. So now I'm talking with them. It's wild to see that landscaping, how it's evolving and changing. And yeah. I hired 52 people in 2022, which that's one a week, right? Like, and it was me and I had a, a company help me with some sourcing, but that was it. And because it was just the wild west and everyone was hiring and everything was growing and I didn't have to talk to people about polar vortex and come on, it's not so bad <laughs> in Chicago. It's every other year that your, your face freezes off when you're outside for more than 10 seconds. And that was always a deal breaker We're talking with these candidates from the coast and or California. And now it's like, Oh, you don't have that hand tie behind your back. So you can do it. So it really exploded with companies. And then companies from the coast were like, you know, cherry picking people from the Midwest and throwing West coast salaries, you know? So it was just like a very dynamic time back then. And yeah. We're... And we ran into some, some of those weird situations too, where like we were just regardless of where the people were, we were paying them California salaries. Yeah, because so, you're based so in California. Got, yeah. So we got to a point where it was just like, eh, this probably doesn't make a lot of sense to continue doing this, but then making that switch, you know, because mm -hmm. we're like, everybody that's here is going to get grandfathered into their salary. So we're not going to change people that are already here. But right. when we started looking at like geolocation paying in the last couple of years now, um, that's provided some interesting challenges. And on top of that, you yeah. have people that are like, you know, I don't want to live in California anymore. I want to move to Idaho. I want to move to Nebraska, where it's right. like a significantly lower cost of living. It's like, well, your pay is going to change. And there's an argument. There's an argument for that as well of just like, yeah. you know, paying straight across the board for for the talent. Right. Um, but that's a whole nother debate and yeah, whole other yeah. conversation. <laughs> yeah. Like we tend to base. Chicago Midwest, which tends to be in the middle, and you know, like for certain parts of the country, like, yeah, that's great. For the coast, it might be a little tricky sometimes, but it's kind of the middle ground, you know. And, um, but yeah, I, I don't be like, well, you know, you're in the Bay, you get 40% more. Oh, you're in Birmingham, Alabama, you get 40% less. Like, you know, it gets tricky 
you know, trying to figure that out because you can't even break it out by zones because like to be in Chicago or to be in Decatur are two very different salaries, right. but you're in the same state. So like how granular do you want to get it? Right. Yeah, it, get, it gets really dicey. Yet. And some of the tools and, and data that we have to utilize that is just not nearly as granular as we'd want it. I know right. at Meta, it was at Meta it was based, it, it was as granular as based on the county that you lived in. Really? Wow. Yeah. Sometimes I hear like three regions. It's literally like dink, dink, dink. And I'm like, well, that one region can be like dramatically different. But Meta was literally down by the like the zip code or the county, which is yeah. not quite zip code. But yeah, wow. But it's interesting even from that standpoint, because if you were to look at, you know, where I'm at, Dane County, you know, you have mm-hmm. Madison, but you have all these like smaller municipalities where it's like you could be, oh, right. tw- you could, you could be 25 minutes outside of Madison and Half the rent you're, probably. Right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. even that, it was like, what's better, the the actual city or or the county? Uh, but they wouldn't yeah. have date. They they wouldn't have role specific data for for each town, you know, right, right. like it, it doesn't make any sense or, or you're just kind of winging it or kind of throwing numbers out. Yeah. Um, Which I've heard companies are starting to do that now. I, th- I think meta, I remember reading about meta doing that too, where it's like, okay, you can move to Kansas, but it's not San Francisco salary. Right. So, right. Yeah. 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 And then they were doing that when I was there, even like you could, if you were remote, you were remote and you could literally live wherever you wanted, but the moment you change your address, like mm. within your profile. Yeah, wherever your your <laughs> HR hub is or whatever. Once right. you change that, then your pay changes. And that was, you know, that was everything from RSUs to your salary. So wow. that's interesting. And who's going to have the data? Meta is going to have the data, right? Like right. If any, if any <laughs> company is going to have data on the people and uh, numbers that is going to do it. So yeah, that, well, that's interesting. Speaking of like, what are you curious about right now in this game industry that we are in and shit that is going on? Exactly. What is going on? Like the, what is that's, going on? that's what I'm curious about. Cause it's like, you know, I had, I, I have a lot of theories. I have, I feel like a lot of data that helps yeah. build credibility in these theories, but the more people get laid off, it's just like, what are the markers that execs are looking at in terms of, you know, mm-hmm. moving the needle in such a negative direction? Like what I, I'm right. curious of what, I don't have that purview. So it's like, I'm right. really curious, of like, what are they looking at that say like, Hey, like today we're letting 670 people go. Obviously that decision wasn't made today, but it was announced today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. And even with, you know, with the, with the Activision acquisition, like everybody had to know that there were going to be job losses. Right. I don't think yeah, right. anybody thought that it'd be any, anywhere close to 1900 people. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, what is driving the number? What is driving the decisions around that? Cause mm-hmm. You know, I think you can look at a lot of things. And I I heard somebody else talking recently that was that was talking about how much more video games were being played during the pandemic, especially early in the pandemic, because people were at home. Like they didn't have a lot to do. So it was just like, hey, video game sales you know rose significantly. You had a lot Mm -hmm. of big publishers that were buying all these different studios and working on just a crazy amount of IPs. And I think things just got stretched really thin. I think there was a ton of overhiring during the pandemic, but it's like, what else? Like, what am I missing? Like these things to me seem like they're kind of the surface level things, but it's like, are are we really doing this simply to raise stock prices? Like what are the other factors here? Um, And just like, when is it going to end? Because even the end of 2023, it was just like, oh, I think we're good. I think we're good for a while. I I think a couple of points too was like, there was IP and then, I reposted on LinkedIn. It was a really good article. I can't remember her name. It was Polygon or something, but was talking about, you know, there was this merge and acquisition craziness, right? Like, oh, yeah, like sure. Companies were just, you know, buying companies left and right, and, and loans were cheap, right? And it was, you know, when you've got billions of dollars at 2% and billions of dollars at 7% loan, that's two very different numbers. Yeah. And then the whole idea, at least for mobile specific, was with Apple. It was before the privacy changes that went in when you can opt out of all the tracking stuff that was going on during the pandemic, you know, 
it was so much easier to buy players through user acquisition money. And now Apple's really, to their credit, for the end user, you have a lot more um, controls over wh where your data is getting sold and what's going on. But that also means it's so much harder for those mobile companies to acquire users to try and get them, especially for free to play games, to turn into vendors and 99 cent, 299, 599, 99, you know, you know but with the rattle in the can and all that. So the whole industry just went, you know, back. And, and are we cutting too much now where we're being too short term and it's going to have long term impact? You know, because we're slashing too much now. We hired too much and now we're cutting too much. These are all questions, you know, that are just evolving. I mean, yeah, I mean evolving. that's, the, that's the, the biggest thing that, you know, when I when I look at how many of my former colleagues are just like out of the job that I'm absolutely shocked. Like, how do you not have a job right now? And not like right. from the stand, I mean, like simply from like their talent level. It's just like, it's, this is absolutely insane. I think right. today I, I, I wrote, this is madness because it, it really is like, yeah. it's hard. It, you know, when you see a few companies doing it, you're like, okay, I feel like I can justify that. Or like Embracer Group, for instance, like they were that yeah. huge mergers and acquisitions yeah, you know, specifically, they, just, they bought all these studios and were just kept buying and buying and buying and buying. Right. And instead of supporting using those studios to support your big titles, you have everybody working on their own IP and it's just like your own tech and yeah. Your time frame for putting these games out is now exponentially increasing, you know, mm -hmm. to five, six years. Now you're now you're looking at a bunch of rock stars out there where it's just like you can't have five, six, seven years in between your games and be successful. Right. right. Like well, the GTA can get away with that. It. Right. right. Yeah. And it's like, if you have a plan that that's going to be like, you know, game as a, you know, games as a service to where it's like, this is going to be living forever. Like, you know, destiny two comes to mind for that. Right. Um, where it's just like, this game has been around forever. I mean, even GTA five, it's like still making tons I was, of money. <laughs> I was playing that game two houses ago in the biggest cost savings you're going to get as people like it's it's yeah it it's is, burn rate. It is what yeah. it is yeah so yeah. like you you understand it to you know to a point but mm -hmm. you're like when is you know when is this when is this going to stop and now i just feel yeah. like the magic number seems to be you know five to ten percent and now it seems like every big publisher every game studio is putting that out there of like ten percent of global workforce it seems in some cases like you get it and then others you're like really like why <laughs> yeah it, is it really the stock price like is that the pushing factor it's hard yeah. when you it, it's easy when you talk about numbers it's really hard when you think of those numbers actually being people and right. you know yeah. i went through this as well with meta so it's like i was there i was part of that eleven thousand that was let go oh you right. know, yeah yeah in, in in a day <laughs> so it's like i've been there i felt that but you know, that's the biggest thing of just like, when is this going to stop? What is going to come out of this? You know, for sure that they're, that not all those jobs are going to come back. Like, right. I right. hear people talking about it. It was cyclical. It's cyclical. It's just like, this is what happens. Like, no, this has never happened. This has never happened in this industry. And I just feel so bad for so many people that are just like, that studio is not going to come back. Those, you know, looking at like volition, like those 275 right. yeah, yeah. jobs are not going to come back. Right. Uh, unless right. somebody starts their own studio, but then it's just like, then you have such a slow burn to get to, you know, that level of hiring. So, and it's costly. Yeah. It's extremely costly. Start your own studio. It's like, really? With what, what yeah. overhead? So, yeah, just, yeah. No, no, there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah. There's a lot of opportunities out there for people to band together and start something significant, but mm -hmm. you have to have the capital. You have to have the money. And, I don't know if there's, you know, I know there's there's a few investor companies out there that are willing to to yeah, put VCs in VCs or whatever, yeah, right. But right. that's hard to find, and this is this is a risky. This is now I would I would have to imagine from a VC standpoint, this is a risky move. This yeah. this was probably you know looking at this two years ago. This was like oh games. The highest right, they've right. ever been, right. billions and billions of dollars. License to print money. Like, yeah. I don't know. I don't yeah. know if this is the best use of our money. So yeah, um, that's the hard part. And that's, that's going to be interesting to see where mm. things go from here. I think a couple of things, like if you're let go and all that kind of stuff, maybe there's ways to start something small with, you know, friends and family and just doing something like that, you, you know, the, and maybe you can 
figure something out. Although, you know, all the platforms are tough, you, you know, I make a game, I put it on Steam, 99 point whatever percent don't make any money, right? Like, so how do you, yeah. how do you rise above? And the studios that can kind of go off and get money and build from scratch the trend i see they always have big names attached to them right like yeah because people want to bank on something all right oh that person did this this and this they have a track record right and then you know those are the startups that get the money because there's there's juice there's there's a proven track record so maybe you go to one of those studios if you're not one of those marquee persons that has the name that's going to get money and investors to fund it. But yeah, it's a weird time. Are, are, are these all coming back? You like to think they are, but then there's also AI factoring into stuff and not that you should shy away from it or be a Luddite, but you know, it's just changing the landscapes going on right now. Uh, I know we've been kind of doom speaking here, but like, what about, uh, opportunities? Like what, what about things that you're excited about or like, Oh, this is positive. Um, well, I think it, like one of the one of the biggest things that I saw in 2023 was the industry banding together. So even mm -hmm. when I think of when I was recruiting at Activision, I was on a team of recruiters, but we had our own studios. So we were actively competing with each other for the same talent oh. all the time. So there wasn't much sharing. There certainly wasn't like sharing of of talent to other studios. Like if you came across mm. a great systems designer, you didn't have a systems opening, you hoarded that person. You didn't mm. let anybody else know right, about right. that person existing. So I think like the sharing aspect or, you know, the openness to collaborate, the openness to just have conversations. Mm. Um, I think that's been one of the biggest opportunities for 2023, where it's just, it's opening a lot of doors for people from a networking standpoint. And yeah from even like sharing of information and best practices and things that, you know, a lot of people held closer to the chest. I feel like in previous years, I feel like that's really opened up significantly now. And, you know, I look at the beginning of, I came back to striking distance in January, 2023, probably the first five months was, I was literally just helping people get hired at other places. And it's not that I didn't, I wasn't trying to fill roles. It's just like I had a right. few roles to fill. And with all the layoffs that were happening, it was just like, I was literally just trying to find like, people that I, you know, yeah. I got laid off from Meta. So I was trying to help people that also got laid off from Meta find jobs. Yeah. Um, Cause I felt like it was necessary. Like I think of one individual that I, I got hired at ready at dawn and mm. he was the last person I hired before I got laid off. And I was like, my, you know, my stomach sank when he messages me on LinkedIn. He's like, I got let go today. And I was like, I was like six months. <laughs> like, holy right. crap, are you serious? So then I just like felt like, you know, I pulled him from Microsoft oh, to come right. to Meta. And right. now six months later, because he was there for like eight years. Right. So he was leaving a lot on the table to make that transition. Yeah. And, you know, he's just one of many that I was like, I need to help find you guys jobs. Like I have to, uh, I have to do this. And yeah, if I, if I, I, you know, I also used it as a networking, you know, activity as well. It's like, Hey, if you find a job that you're interested in message me and I'll see if I know somebody there because yeah that's going to be your best way of getting in is either a direct referral or, you know, talking directly to that recruiter who's handling that position or that hiring mm -hmm. manager who that position is going to report to. That's been a big, that's been a big change or, or a big opportunity specifically in 2023 and, and this year, just that, that openness and like, yeah, that you know, I, I, I mentioned we're all in this together, help each other out type of stuff. Yeah. And I mentioned that with Amir, previously of just like, you know, the hundreds of mentors that are donating their time to yeah. level people up and, and just, you know, his aggregate of jobs where mm -hmm. people can share that and like, just look at his, you know, he's got a dedicated from, website now too, right? Like it used to be yeah. on LinkedIn and now there's the website and I'm going to put that in the show notes. Um, 
uh, I forget where you even started. Created. Like I, f- I forget where you even started when he really started that push of like, you know, mm-hmm. I think he was like maybe three thousand followers, and and now yeah. you're looking like a year later, and I think he was coming pretty close. I mean, I could look it up right now, but um, yeah. I think he was coming pretty close to a hundred thousand. Wow, you know? I was gonna, I was to say fifty, but yeah, yeah, wow, yeah, no. Yeah. That's good for I him. I mean, that's that's a lot of eyes on mm. on what he's created and a lot of voices that, you know, you could see people tagging other people. I mean, I did it today. There was yeah. a few people that I knew that got laid off and this new studio that popped up, they listed a bunch of their jobs and I was just like, you know, tagging people in it that I knew were available that I yeah. would recommend their skills. Like I either interviewed them, hired them or worked with them in the past. And, mm-hmm. you know, if we all did that, and I'm not saying everybody can, because there's a lot of us that are, that are jobless right now from a recruiting standpoint, but yeah. like, if we could, if we could all hone that energy and like, think of those individuals that would be good for that job, like, mm-hmm. Even if it's a handful here and there, that certainly helps. But man, we yeah. could we could fill we could fill everything if everybody was working together and playing together. So, um, yeah. but I like what I'm seeing from that standpoint, and I think there's you know that's probably the the biggest opportunity that I see right now is just the openness and willingness mm-hmm. to share information and and help each other out. Yeah, there's some other people too, which I, I don't remember seeing in years past, where they're just like. Hey, here's a whole list of entry level roles. And sometimes I like Mm -hmm. repost them that do that or, you know, real frank thoughts about getting jobs. Is it Richard? Richard King. Yeah. King. Yeah. Yeah. He's Um, one of my good buddies. (laughs) Oh, you know, he, um, I did that for eight years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. He had a post to to that. I did a screenshot of one of his posts about resumes and I used that in a presentation I did to Paul and it was just like, you know, Here's the truth coming from a recruiter. This is other people saying this. So yeah, he's a good person to follow in addition to Amir and all these other people. Um, but yeah, small world, right? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, I worked in for eight years. Um, that's a, I mean, that's a huge benefit. And it's like, if you can help a handful of people get hired else, well, that's the crazy part though. Like I can't remember a single time in, you know, the last nine years where I posted another studio's job on LinkedIn. Yeah, and now yeah. and now everybody's everybody's doing that where they're, they're yeah. like, "Holy crap!" There's a studio hiring because there's. Right. So, I feel like they're so sick of hearing about layoffs that they're like, "Let's get right. some people hired." So just that like solidarity, like even yeah. if you haven't been affected, like I think yeah. that's probably the, the best thing in games that's come out of 2023. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I'm seeing it can it continue and like that just builds relationships that builds your network like. I'd rather see positive things than the negative things. So, yeah. And especially like, you know, Oh, this company's hiring for these roles and I'm not filling for any of these roles. Right. So why not share it? And somebody who's connected to you or follows you then sees that this role that you're not hiring for anyway, and they go work at that company, you know, or yeah, sometimes when I turn candidates down, I point him at Grackle, I point him at a mirror. Cause it's like, Hey, not fit here, but, Look at these other resources, right? Like go out there and look at these sources. Maybe you can find a role here. Here's a loaded question. Like, what are your thoughts on AI, especially around recruiting? Because there's all this like, oh, my job got turned down because an AI robot rejected me. And that's why I got turned down so fast. It's like, not necessarily. <laughs> you know, it could have just been going through resumes at that same time you posted and you were way off the mark and a human on the other end did it. Do you have any thoughts on AI and recruiting? There is such a misunderstanding of <laughs> recruiting, especially from like the ATS standpoint, or it's yeah. like yeah. the ATS bot. It's like, no, I can I can put in knockout questions that if you don't have the right answer to that, that mm-hmm. you will get rejected. But right. I hardly ever use those. And yeah. the only reason I would use those are, is really for high volume roles where I know that I'm going to get a lot of applicants and I right. know that I'm not going to be able to go through all of those applicants. Yeah. A thousand applicants, um, right? Listen, people, a thousand or more, right? Like, it's not like, oh, there's 50. There's like a thousand. So, yeah. Yeah. And I told you this earlier where it was just like, I, I just posted a senior recruiter role and, you know, within three days I had to shut it off because we had over a thousand applicants for it. So that is me literally going through those resumes as a right. person with no knockout questions, no right. AI help, but yeah. you know, that stuff does, 
exist, not so much in the ATS, but um, or at least in AI greenhouse, is- like because we're both in greenhouse, which is one of the yep. big ones. But I've heard Workable has AI for doing some of that kind of stuff. But yeah, like I, I have people asking me, like, what's ATS? What's going on? Like, like there's some secret cabal of something with ATS. Well, that's a, yeah. you know, your, 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 your TikTok influencers. With yeah. Do this hiring. apply for every job. <laughs> Shut up. Or it's just like, you know, I've, I've seen a couple where it's like how to beat the ATS bot, how to beat the bot. <laughs> it's, it's like, I've seen just crazy things like doing all of these like keywords at the bottom of your resume in, Oh, Right. In white. So it doesn't show up on the resume. But oh, like it, it's some it, kind of SEO is, things going on. Yes, so they, yeah, yes. yeah. It is seen. Oh. It is seen by the bot and it matches you to the job. And it's like, yeah, the vast majority <laughs> of us are not doing that. Like, that's not right. really a thing. Like, yeah, sure. That that might help you in certain scenarios. But to think that this is like globally the way that it works is right. just so far from the truth so some posts are trying I mean, to get viewers uh, it's just like yeah yeah I, and i think there's good things i think there's bad things like one of my pet peeves earlier um last year was ai from the standpoint of applying for jobs within linkedin so mm. you could have the ai write your message so you applied for a job and there was like a toggle switch and it was like message oh right hiring right. manager And it would just, it Mm -hmm. was the same thing. It was just this, the same generic statements. And it was just like, what is going on? Like I got 15 (laughs) in a row for one, for one job. And it was the same, it was literally the same message. It just changed out. Like, you know, it was, it was like your CRM formatting. (laughs) Quick question. Quick question. company that they worked at. Can we jump on a call? Because of this experience. uh, Right. I think I'm great for this job. When can you jump on a call next week? Or, you know, something to that variation. I'm just like, yeah. Oh, make it stop. Make it yeah. stop. <laughs> no and that, for that, for that specific reason, um, because within LinkedIn, I am the hiring manager for all the roles. And we had talked about do we want the actual hiring manager to be the hiring manager for their role on LinkedIn? And I was oh, like, because of this, right. no, no, like, I no, I don't want this. I will I be the bouncer. To, I will yeah, be I don't the red velvet. I have to deal with this. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. But I think it is helping. Like, I, I think AI from, you know, there's some different functions, like being able to, you know, put some resumes. Resume, yeah. yeah. Put some, but put somebody's resume in that you're like, this is the ideal candidate. Like, write me a job description around this. Like, yeah that's cool. Like, I hope right. you're still going to edit that, but that's a, right. that's a pretty cool function that you can have be a part of that. Or, or somebody mm-hmm. that maybe isn't the greatest writer being able right. to use AI for, for their resume or their cover letter, mm-hmm. um, things like that, or even LinkedIn, your LinkedIn posts and, and things like, I, I think yeah. that can help bridge that gap of of skill set that some people just simply don't have yeah um or they're not very good at it um yeah. so i so i think so it's you like, it, to help that yeah right. yeah. yeah but i don't think like i was recently on a demo for a sourcing ai mm. and it was very interesting and intriguing and my joke was like yeah i'll do this i'll do this call i'll do this demo as long as this thing doesn't replace me <laughs> um <laughs> but seeing it like how it can actually um how you can train it to source how you think and i was mm-hmm. like you know there are some serious time saving efforts but i've also yeah. seen the other side of that where it's like it's faux ai where it's actually <laughs> like you're putting prompts in of like you know you're giving it feedback but it's it's, right. it's a physical person on the other end i'm like that's not ai really <laughs> it's not AI oh. at all yeah no no yeah there's been well there was a company that we used to use called uh v source and they were based in vietnam and okay. you would get you would give them the job description you would write all your specifics and they would do sourcing so the yeah. the the positive side of that was it was, you know, it was real people that you were interacting with and right. they were working hours you weren't. So yeah, right. you could the, the you 24 come hour in and all of a sudden you've head. got all these, all these people to go through from a prospecting standpoint. Yeah. Um, but I, but I have heard of companies that are, that are actually showcasing an, you know, an AI 
product <laughs> where it's where it's literally just a person a doing person it on the other end. Really? And I've not heard of that. And I can't that's say funny. that that's a that that's a good or bad thing, but it's like mm. don't misrepresent what your tool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's disingenuous. Um, well, and since you talked about cover letters, let me open up this can of worms. What are your thoughts on cover letters? Right, like uh, where do you I kind of fall on that? Post, I, I just I just responded to a post uh, recently it was about cover letters, and you know I was you know they were making the point of don't be lazy, write a cover letter. But he's like, however, make it three or four sentences. Don't make it four oh, paragraphs right. long. Right. And and make it very specific. Of, and then when I was eight, you know, I got Super Mario. And then yeah, yeah, yeah whatever, man. Who who you Person. are, what you do, what you're right. looking for, and then call to action. You know, right. like, and that's all I really need to see. Like, I I mm-hmm. can't tell you the last time like I went through and read an entire full page cover letter. Right. Because yeah. it's just not. It's it's you know when I've got hundreds of resumes to go right. through, like I'm right. not looking at everybody's cover letter, especially if they're not a fit for the job. If I can right. tell from their resume that they're not a fit for the job, why would I bother looking at the cover letter? Right. It's not um, going to tip the scales and, enough. Yeah. Right. And I did say this of like you know it might help me unearth something and one that something is probably passion. Like if I can see yeah. by what they're writing, like that they're incredibly passionate about this industry, mm-hmm. you know, that might be something that tips the scales in, in their direction. Yeah. Like if all the hard skills are the same from candidate to candidate, but yeah. the vast majority of time, I, I could say there's one hiring manager. He was a design director where he wanted cover letters written for, from for every, every candidate. Applicant. Wow. And applicant better word that they weren't a candidate yet <laughs> yeah yeah exactly right <laughs> want to go into semantics and split hairs but you know that's yeah that's, that's her that was the thing where it was just like on the job posting it said you must submit a cover letter and mm. literally he was just like reject them if they don't have it i don't care if they have the right experience or anything else i was just like so part of that i was just like really so you just right. reject people that don't and it's like well it's attention to detail they're not following they're not following rules they're not f- following what's being asked of them i'm like all right i, I yeah. guess i understand that but mm-hmm. that's one of the few roles that i can really point to in the last 10 years in games that I've read cover letter. QA was one that I did when we didn't have specific requirements for QA, like that evolved over time to where we wanted people that actually had a degree in something within games. So whether that was yeah. art, design, production, engineering, mm-hmm. we wanted them to have that experience. So at least they're coming in with some mindset or understanding of how game development works right but before that when it's like i'm literally going through resumes of anyone who, yeah, and, and yeah, most right. people most people like hey we're only looking at local people here because we're not going right, to so that narrows the pool. yeah QA. we're not going to relocate right yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> and we've exactly. got 30 and we've got 30 to hire like at that yeah, yeah. at that point if i don't see like true experience in their resume i'm going to mm-hmm. go to their cover letter and then mm-hmm. that's where I'm going to hear them. Like ever since Mario, I've always been into games and like, you know, yep. that's where I think it's like actually appropriate to dive into that when I'm just like, there's really no yeah. differentiation in hard skills at all here. Like yeah, if, yeah, they, yeah. if they do like, yeah, I'll move them along, but it's not easy to find 30 people in a short period of time that have the right skill set for the job. Right. Um, Who are local locally, too, right? Locally. Yes. Locally. <laughs> that's the key. No, that's a good point because I, I always dismiss that. Like, I don't want to hear your play Mario, but like that's for a role where it's specialized and it's not local, you know, and then in those cases for me, like I want to see a cover letter. I don't want to read War and Peace, right? I don't want 19 pages and I want to see it maybe tie back to a bullet point or two in the job description. Yes. My job description that talks about, I do that thing in that software, right? Like, and it's not the cookie cutter one. Like a lot of times you just see these cover letters and it's control C, control V and it doesn't have anything to do with the job description. So I'm like, it almost is worse than than not having a cover letter because it's like, it shows you kind of tone deaf because like your cover letter doesn't say anything about the job description and you're just copy and pasting it. Or it'll be like to fill in name, you you know, those like people that just, they have like a template, they don't fill it out and you're like, oh, you know, that's bad. But like, if you're on the cusp 
and then the cover letter ties back to the job description. It ties to some stuff. It can be kind of like that icing on the cake where it'll be like, all right, I'll talk to that person versus if it was like, and then there's no cover letter, maybe not. So, you know, like all things, it, it depends, but yeah, it, it's a very controversial topic in our field, right? Like cover letters suck. I never look at them or cover letters are the greatest thing in the world. Everyone's got to have one, you know? That, yeah. And, you know. and to that person's point, um, I was like, yeah, if you're going to, if, if you're going to do it, like make it short and concise, like make me, yeah. make me want to read it. Right. Like, if you I, want I to talk to that person, you know, mm-hmm. like that's the whole job of the cover letter resumes. I want to talk to that person. That's the only step of that thing. Get the next step. I had somebody recently apply and they literally went bullet point for bullet point of the job description and expressed how they fit that bullet point. Mm-hmm. And it was like yeah. three pages long. Yeah, that's a little scary. And I was just like, yeah. no. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> yeah. I've had those before too. Yeah. Where it's just like, you're just like, Whoa, this is, you know, and it's like, and therefore you should hire me. It's like, okay, that is more to it than just those bullet <laughs> points, you know? Um, yeah, this was overkill. <laughs> and that gets into like, read the room, like understand, like, mm-hmm. I, I think that's the thing people f- forget if it's like, like we just have like four resumes to look at for the day. Right. You know, it's like, no, there's, you know, you go into that greenhouse and you just have that stack of resumes and it's just like, you've got that impression. It's just like matching the job description, matching, matching, not matching, not matching. All right. Trending bad, trending bad. And it's like, you know, it's a numbers game, right? What is it? Five, 10%, you know, of resumes. If you were to take a hundred applicants, like what, what are the likelihood, what percentage are going to get a phone call, you know, five or 10 out of a hundred, just spitballing, but yeah. No, I, I think that's that's accurate. And <laughs> honestly, for a lot of positions, like the higher the role goes, like you know, it's, yeah. it's you know, you're getting less less candidates, but you're still getting so many people that are just so off. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. And that right. goes back to like, oh, well, I'm looking for an entry level design position, so I'm gonna put my name in for every the level senior of design, design position. Right. <laughs> so. right. You miss every shot you don't take. Y- yeah. Okay, Gretzky. <laughs> um, <laughs> Or the, the people that have, you have very specialized roles with specialized skill sets and very widely between different roles. And you see the name and then you look at all the other senior roles yeah. they applied for and you're like, what the record? This? The record no. I saw was one individual applied for 23 open roles. 23. Whoa. And he was an entry level designer and applied, even applied for des- uh, our design, design director? director role. <laughs> And it's just like, why? <laughs> like, sometimes I've even put like, for a couple kind of like hard requirements, like, you know, have you done this in unit, you know, unity or whatever, and you, you put those in the job description, and it m- maybe calls it down a little bit. But then people click yes. And then you look at the resume. And you're like, No, you don't, you, you just click the box. You, you know, it's, it's like you, your resume clearly does not speak to those things that were asked <laughs> in the, the drop down. <laughs> I beat the ATS bot. <laughs> right, I did it. Man, the TikToker taught me how to do it. Just say yes to everything. Um, it's not spray and pray. It's be curated, be smart, apply for roles that you have most, if not all of the requirements or a lot of the requirements and, and do it in a very curated, mindful way. Speaking of, what's a funny or odd story from working in the industry? One of us was my initial interview at, at Activision and I interviewed with the HR director and the HRBP. And then they just pulled in a random director, like Mm. discipline director to interview me. And they, they grabbed the design director and he comes in and interviews me. And, you know, I tell him I'm a huge gamer and this is the, the greatest cross section of my, you know, my work skills and my passion. And he asked me, you know, what do I play? And I was like, well, I, I play a lot of first person shooters. So I play, you know, I play Call of Duty and, you know, yeah. which is super cliche. I'm literally interviewing at a Call of Duty studio. And then I'm like, you know, I play Battlefield and, and he's like, oh, so do you play, you know, single player, multiplayer? I'm like, yeah, I play both. I, I 
usually play through the story and then you know i I play a good amount of multiplayer and he's like right you know what do you like better battlefield or call of duty without even thinking about it i said battlefield so i'm telling a design director (laughs) call of duty call of duty right (laughs) that i prefer battlefield and it dawned (laughs) on me immediately i was was like oh my god what have i done and (laughs) <laughs> quickly i, I didn't rewind track so much but i was like right. i explained why and i'm like i'm not okay. a quick twitch shooter like so call right. of duty that's very much what it is and i'm right. like i'm not good at that and battlefield i can at least play with a squad and i can help them so i can play support i can right. get medic ammo yeah, i yeah, can right. i can be a medic i can revive them and right. um he didn't say no. He hired me. <laughs> so, but, I, <laughs> but I always, I always bring that up of like that could right. have been, you know, that could have been the demise of a ten-year career that never <laughs> happened. Um, right. <laughs> there's quite a few, quite a few breaking the build during play testing yeah. uh, stories where I did that thing that you weren't supposed to do in that play test that literally ruined the whole round for everyone. <laughs> so it like literally wasted that half hour or 40 minutes. People screaming, like if it was in person, right? You're like, ah! one of the, one of the, yeah. <laughs> one of those was making, so yeah, we were all on site and yeah. we had a play, te- we had a play test pit that was kind of in the front of the building. So you had mm-hmm. everybody on, on QA that was on their machines because they had the build and, you know, right. other people would kind of file into these, I think it was like 15 or 20 um, dedicated machines to play test. And we would do it every day. And I remember with Warzone, it was like, do not get into the vehicle. Like, very blatantly, oh. <laughs> do not get into the vehicle. It's a known and bug. I didn't, do not do that. Right. I didn't read it. I didn't know it was a thing. And literally, you know, it's a Battle Royale game. So you have, you know, at that time we had 100 I think we had a hundred players and you know, it whittles down gradually yeah, yeah. Right. and I destroyed it about a half hour in cause I got into the vehicle yeah. and I didn't know it. And, and all of a sudden it's just like, who is on? Uh, who's blah, blah, blah. Like yeah. each, each machine was named and I was like, Oh, oh my God, man. it was me. Oh my, what, what happened? <laughs> Crawl into so, this desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that that half hour play test was like immediately scrapped because of that because it literally uh, it, it, it broke right. the build. <laughs> yeah, those are two of my personal favorites. Um, yeah, what about the games you're playing right now that you're excited about? I am a hoarder of games that I will likely never play. Like <laughs> my Steam backlog right. is just ridiculous. <laughs> I have a two and a you know I have two and a four year old, so the amount of time that I can dedicate <laughs> to gaming is tough. But right now I'm playing right. a game called Enshrouded and <laughs> it is a game made by Keen Games out of Germany. Mm. And it's kind of like this it's an action platform style game. Uh PC. PC. I'm mainly okay. uh I'm mainly a PC gamer. Okay. Um but it's kind of like it's kind of Zelda-ish in terms hmm. of like cool. action adventure, sword and bow, armor and right. that kind of thing. Stylized or yeah. Yeah. And it's a heavy crafting game. So like to get that new gear, like you have to get to that area that has that stuff. So yeah. I'm enjoying it from from that standpoint. Um, but yeah, I always go back to games that I've been playing for years. I consistently do that. Like Civ Six is probably one of oh. the biggest ones that I continuously go back to. Right, that's so deep. Um, yeah, that game. Seven Days to Die uh, is another one yeah. that I just yeah, it's still in alpha. I think it was originally came out in 2015. It's still in alpha. Yeah, my <laughs> one they, son was playing that. Yeah, <laughs> but they keep right. they keep adding to it, and like they continue making it a better and better game. Uh, I'm always playing a Total War game because I'm just a kind of a strategy nerd. So I'm playing Total War Pharaoh. Uh, okay. So looking forward to additional DLCs and releases on that. And uh, one of the newer games I jumped into was uh, City Skylines Two. So they another you know city builder and I think I bought that and I played it yet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm playing. I, I'm actually playing that on the Xbox Game Pass. But oh. I was trying to get into the exciting, you know, what everybody was jumping into in terms of like PAL World and 
mm-hmm. you know, the Pokemon clone. Yeah, the lawsuit with Pal World. And everything. Yeah, I started playing it. I just I couldn't get into it. But yeah. one of the games I'm excited for that I haven't jumped into yet is what everybody else is excited about, and that's Hell Divers Two. So mm-hmm. that's gonna be one I'll pick up at some point. But at that point, like. People probably won't even be playing it anymore. So. <laughs> hey, where is everybody? Yeah. It's like, oh, it's a co op multiplayer game and nobody else is playing it anymore. Right. right. <laughs> but for having a two year old, your two year old and a four year old, that's pretty robust catalog, right? Like, it's not like you I know, sacrifice I play Candy Crush I, for three minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I sacrifice sleep for making sure that I still get my gaming in. So, coffee, do your magic every morning. Or espresso. Yeah, that's my new thing. I have an espresso machine. It's like right <laughs> in the veins. Um, no, it's good stuff. What about anything I should have asked you about but didn't? This was really, I felt like this was really comprehensive from, you know, yeah. talking about our roles, talking about the state of the industry, talking about specific things about me, talking about, you know, everything that, that job seekers can do to stand out and you know best practices yeah. and things like that so no i think this is a pretty comprehensive list yeah pdfs send your resumes as pdfs right like at least for me i don't know about you but like the times when i can't use the preview mode and then you're like oh i have to download this doc file is there going to be a virus on it you know it's usually a, a doc file but pdfs are agnostic you can read on any device do your resumes pdfs sorry i just threw that out there i was thinking of it <laughs> Would you agree? Like, do yeah, you yeah. See, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's way easier, you know. Yeah. You know, especially if I'm, if, especially if I'm looking at, you know, because I've got greenhouse on my phone. So yeah. no, like, you can totally if do if that. I'm, yeah. If I'm pulling resumes and want to look at them on my phone, it's just easier in PDF. Um, so where can people find you online? Like website, socials, stuff like that. I don't have a website, <laughs> so yeah. it's pretty much the main place you can find me is on LinkedIn. I do have a Twitter account that I don't really use. It's not even called Twitter anymore. That's how. Yeah, it's, it's that, extra that's now the last time. That's yeah. the last time I used it. Um, right. So that's probably not a good way to get a hold of me. But LinkedIn is definitely the the place. You, you post a lot of interesting stuff on LinkedIn, so you know, totally worth a follow. Anyone that's listening to this to follow Keith because yeah, he's he's doing a lot of good stuff on LinkedIn. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. <laughs> Click the button now. <laughs> Apply for every I job. Help, I, I heard it helps the algorithm if you say it. Yeah, right. It helps that <laughs> ETS algorithm if you can trick it. Um, last question. Like, What's one piece of advice you give others working in the industry right now with everything that we've talked about? Specifically right now, have a backup plan. Like, Be proactive. Mm-hmm. Always have your resume up to date. Always optimize your LinkedIn. Update your portfolio. And this is kind of funny because you referenced them already. But you know, as my good friend Richard King says, you know, understand your financials and what it would be like if you are out three, six, six 12 months. 12. Yeah. Have a game yeah. plan, have a backup plan. Make sure that you're always in the forefront of people's minds. And mm-hmm. that's gonna come from networking. And that kind of goes back to the well, all my peers are on art station. Well, all the people doing the hiring and sourcing and reviewing are on LinkedIn. So make sure that you have your information up to date because people aren't going to come calling if there's nothing there. Those are great points. To your point about backup plan, finances, savings, right? Like there's a great book, Psychology of Money, um, that I've recommended to people. Nothing to do with gaming, but it just talks about, you know, living below your means, squirreling away money when you can, and just having that buffer because I think it helps with your peace of mind being in this volatile industry if you're not living paycheck to paycheck or even worse living in the red if you know you make find ways to save money and and you have some padding there to know if the shit hits the fan that you've got some buffer yeah i've seen too, yeah i've seen too many people recent that you know had no thought process around what could happen if this happens I mean, I was one of them. I never thought that I was going to be on the chopping block at Meta. Like, that was not a thing. I thought, yeah, they're probably going to let some people go. But never once did I think that it would be 11,000 people at a time. Right. So, you know, and that was really a situation where I was blessed from that standpoint because, like, I still got paid for several months after that. 
where that's not the case for a lot of people. You know, I talked to actually somebody who's in my bowling league that happened to recently. And um, he literally, it was just like, I had a job yesterday. I don't have a job today. There's no severance pay. There's no additional money. There's no bone. Like there's just nothing. Right. So, you know, I've seen, you know, quite a few people. I mean, it doesn't take you long on LinkedIn to see the, I've been out for eight months. I haven't had a job since like, last may or whatever it is and like it's horrible to see people in that situation especially when you then go click on their profile and then see just nothing in their linkedin or they're engaging with no one they're not doing anything that's really the piece i feel it's even simpler than living within your means because i think living within your means at times like when you're used to something is difficult um but if you can at least have yourself prepared with having a game plan of like, what am I going to do if this happens? Um, Or, you know, swallow your pride. Like I'm going to have to leave this industry that I love to do something that's going to make money to support my family for this period of time. Um, So just, you know, being open to transitions and, you know, that's maybe come back later. Right. If I want to, or maybe I'll be happy in this newer career. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Those are my parting pieces of advice. I think too, like the bigger companies tend to be better about taking care of people. Right. Like you said, meta and like, I've been laid off multiple times and, you know, I was at Viacom and, and then Disney was very good about, you know, severance and stuff, but you know, for every Disney, there's telltale out there where they just, that second time they just shut the doors yeah. and screwed everybody, right? Nobody got severance, nobody got nothing, right? So those are the ones where your heart really goes out because it's like, you know, they got caught totally blindsided. There was no padding provided by the company at all. It was just lights out, you know? But cool, thank you so much, Keith. This has been great. I'm glad we were able to connect and do this. And it was been an awesome conversation like I knew it would be, so thank you. Yeah. We could clearly talk for hours. I don't think there's <laughs> any any worry or issue there. We didn't even share too many war stories. This was a lot of fun, and I really appreciate you working with my schedule and being flexible and allowing me to be on here. Thank you for everyone that listens and watches the YouTube channel. YouTube. Five years later, I finally learned how to do the YouTube. So <laughs> smash the like button. Right. Smash the like. Subscribe. Uh, and all those other things I'm supposed to do for the algorithms. But thank you. Thank you, Keith. Absolutely.